Okay, so I have a question for you. How many of you negotiated your first job? Okay, now notice you don't see my hand going up either. That question was posed to college students and the results kind of took my breath away. How many negotiated their first job? Turns out 57% of men. Okay, I can live with that. Only 7% of women asked for something more than what they were offered. Now, why does that statistic bother me? Why is that statistic so disturbing? A couple of reasons. First of all, as a college professor, you know what? I teach my men the same way I teach my women. I'm sending out the same message, and yet, boy, different things are coming back. Secondly, as I tell my students, you know what, I am just concerned about that 50% of men who don't negotiate as I am the 93% of women who don't negotiate. What should that number be? 100% and 100%. Third, this statistic accounts in part for the gender gap in pay. What starts out as, as a little difference over the course of a 40-year career becomes a big difference. But here's the other problem with this. Whose fault is it that we don't ask? Excuse me, do not blame that on men. It is our responsibility to ask for what we want. So, I started looking into this. Why don't women ask? came up with a couple of things. One is what I call the Cinderella complex. If I'm a good girl and I just make people happy, someone's going to notice me and reward me. You know what? Works good in fairy tales. Not so much in the real world. Second, second reason that, that the research supports. Women have a greater fear of failure than men. This is what Sheryl Sandberg talks about when she says, lean in. Oh, you know what? Oh, I might fail. So you know what? I'm going to pull myself out of the game rather than take a chance of failing. You teach that which you need to learn. And let me tell you how much I was afraid of failing. At another school, I was in a tenure track position. I was so afraid of not getting tenure. I went to my department head and I said, you know what, I think I'll just teach part-time. And to his credit, he sat me down and he said, Jane, you've got the teaching, you've got the publications, you've got the service, you can do this. And I did, I did, and I got tenure and the rest is history, but I almost pulled myself out. Third reason is it appears that the research would support women tend to be less resilient than men. Resiliency is the ability to bounce back quickly after a failure. I'm from Indiana, I watch a lot of basketball. Drives me nuts. What do men do? They take a shot, they miss, and then whether they have an open shot again, they just keep right on shooting. Drives me and the coaches nuts, okay? <laughs> women, on the other hand, oh, I applied for that position. Oh, I didn't get it, well, I'm never doing that again. Oh, you know what? I applied for that teaching award. Didn't get it. See, I told you I'm really not that good. I applied for that job. Nope, not doing that again. Here's the problem with that. I'm not saying you're going to score every time you shoot, but I can guarantee you this. If you don't take the shot, you will never score. If you don't apply for the job, you are never going to get the job. You have to apply. You've got to take the risk. All of this adds up to confidence. So I needed to find out, can you teach confidence? Is confidence a teachable skill? Spoiler alert, yes you can, and we are doing it right here, right now. So, with the help of a P&G grant, I developed a class for women, a, a professional selling class. And as part of this class, I needed to teach these women how to overcome their fear of failure. So I developed several strategies as a way for them to rethink about how they view failure. And I'm going to give you a couple of my favorite ones today. First one, change the tape in your head. 
Now, what do I mean by that? Think about when you do something stupid. Oh, you know, and then what do you do? How do you talk to yourself? Oh, Jane, I can't believe you did something stupid. Now everyone knows how stupid you are, how clumsy, you know. We, we, we talk to ourselves, we're much harder on ourselves than we ever are on anybody else. And while I'm beating myself up, I'm thinking, and I ask my students, would you ever talk to your best friend like that? Or, in my case, would I ever say that to my daughters? I would never say that. It would devastate them. So then the question becomes, why would you say that to yourself? If you wouldn't say it to your best friend, you have no right to talk to yourself that way. Along with changing the tape, it became apparent that most of us have tapes that have been put in by other people. Maybe a parent, maybe a sibling, maybe the school bully, maybe a you know, misguided teacher. But when we make a mistake, those tapes tend to resurface. Oh, see you though. There you go, Jane. I knew it. It's stupid, fat, and ugly. Knew that you would never amount to anything. Now, that tape is in there, but I'm the one that decides if I'm going to play it or not. So I tell my students, take a look at that tape. First of all, who put it in there? And is that a legitimate source? And hint, if you're not eight years old, your first grade teacher is no longer a legitimate source, OK? So is it legitimate? And then secondly, is it true? That's stupid. Well, you know, I've got a PhD. Maybe not the smartest person in the room, but I can hold my own. Fat, OK, so maybe I could drop a few, but who couldn't? And ugly, you know what? I do the best with what I can. That is not a legitimate tape. And you know what? I'm not playing it anymore. So my students developed strategies to crowd that out. They had their pump up song, or they had their little mantra. I can be pitiful, or I can be powerful. I am going to choose power. Another one of my favorite um, ways to overcome failure, see failure as courage. This is Brene Brown. It's easy to be a critic. Easy to be on the sidelines saying, oh, you should have, you would have. But you know what? Be proud when you're the one who stuck your neck out. You are the person in the ring. A couple years back, I applied for an administrative position. OK, now, side note, I would have been terrible and I would have been miserable, OK? But at the time, I thought, oh, this is what I want to do. I did not even get a courtesy interview, OK? That's pretty pathetic. So, I, you know, when I started, oh, beat myself up, and I thought, you know what? Good for me. The first time I ever applied for an administrative position, and you know what? I'm proud of my application. I said, these are the problems. This is how I would fix it. Yeah. I was the person in the ring. So, my students and I discuss these different strategies, and then they have an assignment to get out there and practice failing so they can practice being resilient. They write up, this is how I failed, this is the strategy I used to overcome it, and then this is how it worked. Sometimes the failures are small, like, oh, I got a B plus instead of an A. Sometimes the failures are failures that have haunted them. I always dreamed about being in the Navy, and I couldn't pass the physical. So they practice this, and then they do practice it. And then we decide, OK, does it work? Oh, yeah, it worked. What we found at the end of this class, we reduced their fear of failure statistically significant. In other words, it was not by accident. Something's going on. Levels of resiliency, my women rose to levels of resiliency equivalent to men. We closed the gender gap on resiliency. And then, in terms of confidence, turned out the women coming out of that female sales class had greater confidence in their ability to sell than the men. In fact, the results were so compelling, we said, hmm, wonder what would happen if we taught this to men? because I'm still concerned about those men who didn't ask for what they wanted either. Men were not as vocal in their praise, but they would come up to my office, shut the door, and say, guess what? I got the raise. I asked for it. I'd say, yes, you did it. There was a group of men who were confident. We knew this from the literature going in. We replicated that result. 
For those men, my, my challenge was, you know what? Now you have tools. You can empower everyone around you. You can build the women up in your lives and you can build the men up in your lives. But here's another really cool, very practical thing that happened. Word got around to corporate recruiters. We have a group of really sharp, really articulate, and really confident women. And they come from all over the country to talk to our women. And I say, that's great, absolutely, welcome, come. And by the way, I've got also some really sharp, confident, articulate young men. Would you like to talk to them too? Well, yeah, sure, sure. So they come for the women, they stay for the men, and guess what? Everybody wins. It is a win-win situation. So here's what I want to leave with you today. Empowering women benefits everyone. It is not us versus them. It is we are all in this together, and together as partners, we build each other up. And confidence is a teachable skill, and you can learn it. Thank you very much.